Welcome to Oh God, What Now? I'm Dorian Linsky. Today on the podcast, commentators across the political spectrum appear united for once. Britain is a poor country that should stop pretending it's rich. Are they correct? And are we ready to accept our reduced circumstances? Plus, with Parliament out until September, we've noticed there are admirable people in the political world after all. We'll discuss our personal heroes. And in the extra bit for Patreon backers, we'll pick our personal best summers of all time. Remember, the podcast is now on YouTube. We're on a mission to clean up your algorithm so you won't be recommended Jordan Peterson videos all the time. Go to youtube.com slash now or follow the link in the show notes. If you're already here, I'm waving at you. Let's meet the panel. Uh, first up, Associate Editor of the New Statesman, Rachel Cunliffe, back from Switzerland. Hello, Rachel. How was Hello. it? Hello. It was wonderful. I turned the news off for a week and I came back and nothing had happened. Pretty much. <laughs> no, no, nothing has happened. That's, we've really got very little to talk about, except, <laughs> except Britain's decline to poverty. Um, after weeks of stop the boats posturing, Rishi Sunak has admitted that it is, a, in fact, a complex problem that can't be solved overnight. You've written a column about that. Yeah. Was it perhaps unwise to reduce a complex problem that can't be solved overnight to a three-word slogan? I think they didn't realise quite how catchy the slogan would prove to be. So what Rishi Sunak actually promised to do when he announced his five priorities in January was to pass new legislation to help stop the boats. And that got truncated to stop the boats. And actually, he has introduced the legislation. So he has done what he said he was going to do. But because it's a really catchy slogan, people are now like, but you haven't stopped the boats. And he went, well, actually, technically, I never said I was going to. And that is having exactly the kind of positive warming effect on his reputation, as you would expect. It's like saying you're going to help find a cure for cancer, but it gets reported as you have a cure for cancer. Yeah, but you spend the first half of the year trading off how great you are because you're finding a cure for cancer. And then at the end go, actually, you've moved the goalpost. That's not actually what I promised. Um wasn't moving the goalposts, Owen Patterson, with, with badges and TB. And he was, someone said to him, have you moved the goalposts? And he said in a live TV clip, no, it's the badges who've moved the goalposts. <laughs> uh, and I feel something similar may be going on here it's with the badges. It's the badges again. <laughs> it's the badges. It's always the badges. Um, so is this party why Labour is at an amazing 50% in one recent poll? So I think that that probably has more to do with collapsing public services, everyone feeling poorer, interest rates, inflation, cost of living crisis. Um, I think those are the issues that are making even people who were Tory leaning think, hang on, this lot haven't got a grip. Uh, And it's not like Labour is massively trusted on immigration and, and, and on being tough on channel crossings either. However, it doesn't really help that the government is pointing to one thing that differentiates themselves from Labour and showing themselves to be handling it really, really badly. Ros Taylor is the host of Jam Tomorrow and author of an upcoming book on trust. Hello, Ros. Hello, Dorian. Uh, Franz Timmermans, the former head of the EU's Green Deal programme, has just resigned in order to fight the general election in the Netherlands. Um, Is his exit a big deal for the EU's climate policy? Who's taking over? Uh, yes, it is a big deal. This is a bit inside baseball, a bit a bit Brussels special. Yeah, uh, like that. yeah, yeah. Uh, now it's not good news that he's leaving for the EU. Anyway, it might be better news for uh, the Netherlands if they get a uh, prime minister who uh, is not here to field as as is happening here with net zero and the backlash that we've seen over the summer. There is a bit of a backlash also in Europe against aspects of net zero. One of them, uh, for example, is the Germans being very annoyed about. Um, there'll be forthcoming ban on gas boilers, which they suddenly realised is going to be really, really expensive for a lot of them. And fair enough, it is. And also agriculture. Now, agriculture has always, of course, been central to the EU and the EU's idea of itself. And one of the aspects of the Green New Deal is cutting down the use of pesticides. They're, and they're responsible for a lot of emissions. So that is going down very badly with a lot of farmers, including in Timmermans' home country, the Netherlands. So there's also no plan for carbon capture. They haven't come up with an idea of how they're going to do that yet, which is a big gaping hole in the New Deal. And they are coming under pressure because the US, of course, is pushing through massive, massive subsidies, massive Green New Deal, and the EU needs to <clears throat> the EU needs to catch up. You might think a low-lying country like the Netherlands would be particularly keen on action on climate change. Well, yes, but on the other hand, there's a lot of pigs and, you know, and, and uh, those pigs need to be sold. You know, bacon, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big thing, uh, agriculture in the Netherlands. And uh, also they've successfully, of course, managed to keep out the sea in previous uh, decades and, and centuries. They're pretty good at that in the past. So perhaps there is a little bit of overconfidence. I'm not sure. 
If it's not the badgers causing trouble, it's the pigs. <laughs> uh, returning this week is one of the writers of Mrs. Doubtfire the Musical and co-host of We Are History, which you can listen to on your way home from Mrs. Doubtfire the Musical. And I first came across him through his excellent book, Things Can Only Get Better, about being a labour activist in a time when uh, being 50% in the polls was the impossible dream. Uh, John O'Farrell, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. Um, by the time most people hear this, Donald Trump will have surrendered to authorities in Fulton County, Georgia. The judge says he can remain free until his trial, provided he doesn't attempt to threaten or intimidate witnesses. How likely do you think it is that he will exercise uh, this self-restraint and respect for due process? I think that he will not overtly threaten witnesses, but uh, he won't discourage his, support, his supporters from doing that. Uh, the, the, the great thing about the Georgia indictment, it means that, A, we get to see a mugshot. I think this was on your show uh, uh, earlier in the week or last week. We get to see a mugshot of him, which I'm really looking forward to. And um, he can't, if he gets elected, pardon himself from state uh, offences so that he can't be innocent uh, after all this has come out. Um, the trouble is, you know, the, the Republicans who support Donald Trump completely believe that he is being persecuted, that this is a witch hunt and that the election was fixed. And there's just no there's just no sanity to any of the debate about this with them. So if there is a mugshot, it'll prove to them that he's being persecuted. And if he is found guilty, it'll prove to them that, you know, he's a martyr and a hero. So I don't really know where we go, apart from just hoping that the people who aren't that interested in politics in America will think we don't really want this guy as our president while he's in jail. Well, this is the same with, uh, you get the same thing with Andrew Tate, where the fact that he is um, being prosecuted for all manner of trafficking crimes yes. and really grim stuff is not a disqualifying, but actually proof that he's uh, onto something over the target, as they say, and therefore is being persecuted. So the more crimes you are charged for, yeah, the it's more what, people like you. It's this whole new world we're into of alternative truths. And um, we, when the internet came along, we all thought, this is great. Well, everyone's going to have so much more information. But we didn't realize that didn't mean, you know, facts that weren't facts. And that's sort of where we are now. We'll try and do some fact facts. <laughs> First this week, consensus. Let's stop kidding ourselves. We're a rich nation and get real. The UK has gone bust, says Will Hutton in The Observer. Britain is now a poor nation. This is the number one issue we face, yet our leaders ignore it rages Daniel Hanan in The Telegraph. Britain should stop pretending it's a rich country, chips in Bloomberg. Uh, the UK is the sixth biggest economy in the world, but only 31st on the list of the richest countries based on GDP per capita. Real household incomes are the same now as they were in 2008. The average household is 20% poorer than its peers in Northwestern Europe. And national debt has trebled in 20 years. And the organization Civic Future recently held an event with the title The Great Stagnation, which must have been a lot of fun. Um, the left wants more investment to curb inflation and boost growth. The right thinks the cause of our woes is too much wokery and regulation again. So is Britain really a poor nation is the first question. Uh, Roz, Douglas Carswell claimed that Mississippi, where he now lives and works, was richer than Britain despite being the poorest US state. And John Byrne Murdoch at the FT responded with some sceptical number crunching, as he is wont to do. Um, how does the comparison hold up? Not very well, but it's a very difficult comparison to make because GDP is a very rough and ready measure of people's comparative wealth. And if you think through it, that makes sense because it's it's impossible to make comparisons between a country like the UK where we get free healthcare and a country like the US where you very much don't and where the state provides different things. Some things, on the other hand, cost a lot more in the UK, like housing much easier to get cheaper housing in Mississippi. Americans are taxless, so they have more take-home pay. It's, it's, it's just because your GDP is lower does not necessarily mean that you may not benefit from things that the state provides. But you know, we are, that doesn't mean to say that we are not, uh, it doesn't mean to say that we're doing very well. And of course, you know, we talk about having free healthcare in this country we do have free health care in theory. Actually, we have uh, health care that we have to often wait a long time for that is uh, rationed in effect. Um, where, you know, you ba basically there are huge obstructions often to actually getting the health care you need. We have really high levels of child poverty as well. And because health care is so bad, we have an increasing number of sick people who are unable to work. And that is going to push down our GDP in turn. Uh, there's a fascinating chart of... Um countries where the capital city takes up the largest, produces mm. the largest amount of wealth. And I think that's led by Seoul, 
um, followed by like Tokyo. Um, and London is very high up there by comparison with about, I think, roughly 25% of mm. the country's wealth, whereas Berlin is more like 4%. Are we, if you take London away, do we see, you know, from the from the numbers, do we see a poor country with one very rich city at the bottom? You certainly see a much poorer country. Yeah, absolutely. And that's because if you take London out of the UK, it would take 14% off the living standards of the UK overall. And that doesn't mean to say, of course, that Britain, uh, that London isn't a very poor city in parts. You know, we all know that London is not a un uniformly rich city. It's not some sort of Zurich. Well, I'm sure Zurich has its poor areas as well, but it, you can't characterise it like that. The, I flew the in rough bit of Zurich. I flew in and out of Zurich Airport, and I have to say it's a wonderful airport. Yeah. So the airport is not one of yeah. the poor bits. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, this is what happens when you, you know, you, you're getting, London is getting to the point when it can only attract migrants to do some jobs because the capital is just too expensive for people who have choices about where they live and how they live to live in. And so you get extremes of wealth within the city itself too, which is what we see in the country too. Because if you look at our GDP as well, back to that, it's similar to France's, but who gets the GDP? The top 10% of households in Britain are actually richer than those in lots of other European countries. But the middle and the bottom are lower. So it's not just, it's not just the poorest who are poorer, it's the, it's the middle classes as well. And this is why levelling up had that instinctive appeal and why Boris Johnson tried to go so big on it. Because it's, although it's fundamentally an anti-inequality slogan, which you wouldn't think normally would appeal to the Tories, it does speak to something that people felt very, very strongly. So there's so many moving parts that, that actually the, the claim that Britain is a poor country, the UK is a poor country, depends on the stats, mm. right? That it's, yeah. it's not depends on which stats you look at. <laughs> there's one stat that's leapt out at me from that Will Hutton article. That was that uh, small children in Britain are among the shortest uh, in Europe. In, and I thought, well, that's something you just can't argue about. If our yeah. uh, if the child poverty is so great that children are not growing as fast and would be several inches or centimetres sh shorter than their European counterparts, there's no arguing with that. It's just a very demonstrative example of how bad child poverty has got in this country over the past 15 years. One, one in three children are living in poverty. Yes. I think that was another stat from there that jumped out of yes. me. That it's, it really is that high and that that is not just an issue in itself obviously it is an issue in itself but if you look at the next kind of 40 years the kind of start those children are getting the kind of education they're getting and their ability to be productive members of society and economy is hampered by that so we're kind of looking at a long-term challenge from that as well um, Rachel, Poland and Romania are on track to match our economic output in the next 10 years. I recall a pretty short read on the New Statesman podcast complaining about the phrase, even Poland and Romania. Yeah, yeah I remember that. <laughs> does, does that reveal, I can't remember if you were on that one or not, but does that reveal a sort of soft xenophobia and a certain sort of hubris that we cannot bear to be overtaken by countries that we're used to looking down on as sort of, you know, post-Cold War yeah. Basket cases. Uh, I think there absolutely is some of that. And uh, in a way, maybe a touch of that xenophobia can be helpful if it means that the Conservatives suddenly take it seriously and go, oh no, we're going to be overtaken by the countries we used to look down on, that we actually have to do something. Now, I don't really think it matters if on paper Poland or Romania or any other country overtake us in economic output, just as I don't think it really matters definitively whether we pick a metric and go, we're a rich country, we're a poor country. In terms of GDP, we're one of the largest economies in the world. In terms of outcomes on various metrics, we, we, we do a lot worse. I think, I think the thing that matters is what standard of living can normal people, most people in this country get. And the fact that we have a huge amount of our GDP, of our national wealth, is tied up in property prices. So we have a whole lot of people who on paper are millionaires. They probably don't feel very wealthy, especially if they've got high mm. mortgages or if they've paid off their mortgages, even if they, they, they sit on these assets, if they feel that uh, they can't make their bill payments or, or shopping's got more expensive or they can't afford the holidays that they used to. The fact that they're sitting on an asset worth several million pounds doesn't really feel like wealth. So you can look at the numbers on paper and go, London is this incredibly wealthy city. A lot of that is tied up in property that doesn't tell you very much about people's lives. Um, John, this is not the economy that Tony Blair inherited. Um, 
And low growth changes politics, especially for Labour. Does it make it more acrimonious if it really comes down to who gets the slice of a not growing pie? I think it is a very different situation to the one that Tony Blair inherited in 1997. Although I don't think I quite appreciated that at the time, that John Major had done anything good or that the, the country was going in the right direction in the end of that major government. Um, now we look at it and go, it's actually a really tricky thing for Keir Starmer to come in because people are going to have huge expectations for uh, change and, and, and improvement in their uh, standards of living and the money just isn't there. Um, so, yeah, I think it's going to be really tricky and uh, it's going to make it much harder for Labour to win that second term, given that we've seen how wildly fluctuating the, 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 the voters are and how shallow I think that support is for Labour, though it seems to be wide, it seems to be quite shallow as well. So, um, I yeah, I think it's going to be very different to 1997 and what, uh, what Blair inherited. Um, and it's going to mean that you know, we're not going to suddenly go, great, there's Labour government, look, all, all the wages have gone up and we're all, you know, paying, inflation's going down. And it's not it's not the, going to be the magic bullet we all sort of hope and sort of presume it will be. Well, Liz Trust, bless her, um, was <laughs> very into growth, <laughs> growth, her. growth. I love how you said that as one word, <laughs> Liz Trust, bless, bless, her. bless her. Um, And she did seem to sort of believe in, like, the magic bullet, which turned yeah, out to be aimed at her own head. <laughs> um you know that this would just kind of like well all you do all you do is you kind of slash taxes and suddenly there is growth and all of these um, frankly very depressing articles are pointing out how um, how long term and structural it is and you can't just come in and just go we found where the growth was hiding here it is so uh, let's talk briefly about the reasons for this Ros we love to blame Brexit for everything it's made this podcast what it is um, and COVID certainly didn't help but. But it does go back further. Is there a kind of, like, what, what are the origins of this low growth, low productivity? Yeah, I mean, the, the terrible irony of Brexit is that, you know, it was in part prompted by the uh, people being fed up with the state of the economy and the inequality in Britain in 2016. And it goes back to the, 20, uh, to the 2008 financial crisis, basically, and what happened after that, because wages and productivity have basically been stagnant until. Uh, since since then. And then we started building in these structural weaknesses that we've got in the economy, as Rachel talked about, the massively high property prices and the way they just keep booming, not building enough housing, the changing kinds of work that we do and the way that there are so many more zero as contracts, which mm -hmm. contributes in quite interesting ways to a lack of productivity. And of course, austerity and what that did to the uh, health service and uh, the knock-on effects that has had. So there are so many things playing into the situation that Britain is, finds itself in now. Yeah, and then looking at that stat that our national debt has doubled in 20 years, I was just like, austerity, you know, for all its other sins, really didn't succeed mm. on its own terms. No. Or any terms whatsoever. No, it, it didn't. Um, and of course, there, you know, the, the questions about whether it was even the right time to do austerity and whether you shouldn't actually have been ploughing more money into the economy is a very live one. Um, John, Daniel Hannan, um, being who he is, thinks that we're getting distracted by, quote, equality, obesity, trans rights and other ephemera. Um, does the economy have anything to do with whether or not politicians are thinking about other things? I, I, well, uh, for A, I didn't actually read that, that article because the Telegraph kept trying to make me join it. And I thought, I'm not doing that. So no. I uh, clicked on it a few times and I thought, OK, well, I can saw the headline. Um, I think there is a serious point here is that we're talking about you know, what Keir Starmer will do when he comes in. I think he'll be a proper politician and he will govern. And I think at the moment we have a permanent campaigning party in power. So they are looking to drive a wedge between the voters and Labour over whatever they can, whether it's small boats or trans rights or woke issues and culture wars. And so, so much focus is, is put onto these issues rather than poverty, cost of living, um, NHS, schools, hospitals. This is what really matters and affects people's lives. And most voters are, will vote on those issues, I think. And I don't think it'll get much traction uh, whether, you know, um, Keir Starmer struggles to answer the question. Question, can a woman have a penis? You know, that's just like uh, um, not what uh, most people are worrying about when they're, you know, queuing up at the post office. So um, there, I think we have a government that is, uh, and we have had really since Brexit, a government that is, seems to be very focused on 
holding on to power rather than using that power to govern and get us out of the mess we're in. I did think it was interesting that it's Dan Hannan saying, oh, we're getting distracted from <laughs> core economic Sorry. issues mm. by things like culture war things and trans rights when Lee Anderson, deputy chairman mm. of the Conservative Party, has literally said, we'll fight the next election on culture war and trans rights. Uh, although trans rights are very much part of the culture war. So that's actually one thing rather than two. I will take that up with him if I ever get the opportunity to... to it was a very weird sort that. of confused piece because I wasn't sure whether Hanan was going, I don't like these things. And it's a very weird thing to just go equality, obesity, as if these are just two things that are very, <laughs> you know, they're very words, similar. It's just Practically say words. Yeah. Um, and he was, it wasn't clear if he was annoyed that the people who were you know, worried about these things, like pro these things, or, or or worried about the people who were anti the things. But he did seem to think that it was sort of, he did seem to suggest that, you know, if your head is all taken up with this, then you can't do that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, but, about, it's about regulation, uh, basically. And it's about saying people who are, are worried about being sued for whatever or being cancelled or for whatever are, are not as productive as they should be because they are basically... Um, they're, they're not free to be as productive as they want to be. So instead of working, they're spending like an hour worrying whether they can tell this potentially racist joke. Well, he went he went into a lot on like <laughs> banking regulation, and and uh, I, I say this as somebody who is midway through a mortgage application at the moment, and there is a lot of red tape a, a, around it. And one of his points was, there's so much bureaucracy, there's so much red tape for businesses and for individuals. How can any of us hope to be? Productive, and again, like I'm, I'm literally having this experience after several hours of doing with that. I, 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 I don't feel the I have the energy to go off and work on my amazing, innovative startup that's going to save the British economy. However, a lot of that stuff is there for a reason, and particularly with financial services regulation, it's there to avoid the kind of build-up of systemic issues that caused the 2008 financial crisis, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and also <laughs> fight things like money laundering and cybercrime, which again would. would generally pretty agreed on the fact that we should probably try and do something about. So he's sort of railing against this regulation and nowhere in the piece, obviously, because he's Daniel Hannan, did he mention that it could have anything to do with Brexit? Well, I didn't have time to do this, but I, I was quite tempted to compare all these pieces and all the things that they think are problems and all the things that they think are solutions and see which ones that, um, align and which ones are completely contradictory. Because there were these weird points of overlap. And the, the biggest, um, I think, was the only fix that everybody seems to agree on is house building. Yep. So can we definitively blame planning regulations and uh, NIMBYs? I think, is that the big one? I think that's a massive part of it. There's another stat that jumped out at me, which is that um, Britain will spend more on pensions in two years' time than on education, policing and defence combined and the sheer amount of tax revenue that goes on pensions has to be paid for by taxes in some areas generally taxes on on workers and, and on sort of younger people and that has an impact on productivity if at the same time you're not building enough houses so you've got massive housing costs really high childcare costs basically all of the economic burdens on one shrinking section of, of, mm. of your electorate to protect another who have the wealth, not all of them, but that is where the wealth is concentrated, but don't feel like they have the wealth and are politically untouchable. As the oldest person in the room, can I just get in, jump in here and blame <laughs> Thatcher for the housing crisis? This is a this is what I grew up doing, blaming Thatcher. But the shortage Why of housing, yeah, the shortage it's of housing. Been dead for a while. I know, but <laughs> it goes back to the sell, massive, massive sell off of council housing and the the fact they made it illegal to put that money into b replacing that housing stock, uh, and the idea that the private sector can solve the housing crisis is. In cloud cuckoo land, you need you know huge public investment in housing, and we had the same problem in the twenties and the thirties. And they eventually, they were, they were the, the you know private firms were building houses for the middle classes. We've we've got to it's such a huge problem, and we have to have government leading the way on it. But it's not even just Brexit that creates additional pointless regulation. I mean, the railways are an example. 
And don't get me started on the strikes because strikes are a terrible blow to productivity. I mean, they're really, really bad productivity, along with all the other strikes that stop you working, that stop you going what where you need to go. Uh, it's the, the way that the railways were privatised basically created huge amounts of regulation multiplied across multiple companies that constantly change. And, you know, the right to get your money back when your train is late. It's a massive admin deal. It's a massive admin deal for everyone travelling and for the companies themselves. And this was entirely created by the structure that they set up and which in itself contributes to the delays because so often the companies don't actually work together. And so these very structures, you know, the deregulation that Hannon is, you know, championing create because of the problems that they they themselves create, create further, further responsibilities and further regulation, which he didn't seem quite quite to grasp. We've done too much, Hannon. So, Rachel, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to end. Uh, Will Hunton wonkishly suggests splitting the Treasury into an office for the budget and an economic strategy ministry uh, to stop the Treasury having the final say on everything. I'm not going to pretend to understand exactly uh, how this would pan out. Mm -hmm. But is this the kind of what might seem to many people a lot more abstruse than build more houses? Is the kind of is systemic reform needed if we're looking at sort of across the span of decades that there are certain things to do with growth and productivity that can't be fixed with the system as it is currently constituted? So there's this idea of treasury brain, which is that the treasury exists to save money or to really, really get value for money on everything, even when that means cancelling infrastructure projects or rescoping them so that they prove half as useful and productive as they originally would have done. Things like having HS2 uh, end in, in out the outskirts of London rather than Euston Station or extending the timeline so that you fit into your budget cycle. It looks like you've saved money in the immediate term, but over the long term, it costs millions or, or billions more. Um, and there definitely is some of that. And there also definitely is some of things that are really difficult to measure in financial terms, like having healthy children and how that's a benefit to society. It's also going to be a benefit to the economy in 10, 20, 30, 40 years time. But it's really hard to measure in a five year term. So you can't do your cost benefit analysis in a way that the Treasury likes. And there's this idea that if you just took the Treasury out of that equation, you'd have better decision making. I think there were two problems with that as a strategy. One is that reorganising Whitehall is a thing that um, leaders and governments love to do to make it look they're doing something and all it does in the immediate term is like create chaos for the civil servants actually working there. No one knows what they're doing. No one knows who they're reporting to. Good work ends up getting lost or having to be redone. Like it might be a good thing to do in the long term but it causes a, a lot of disruption and chaos and every time, every time you think you've got a grip on it uh, the next government or the next minister comes in and wants to do it all again and undo it. So that's the first issue. The second one though is that it's not just the Treasury that means that governments are really bad at thinking long term. It's it's the electoral cycle. It's the fact that you, if you make a decision to have new housing developments, you hear from the residents who are absolutely furious that their green views have been marginally spoiled by other people being able to have homes. Um, and you don't get the electoral benefits of that for years or, or decades. And politicians aren't very good at, at doing that. So I would... Democracy is the problem. Really. I kind of think maybe democracy is the, <laughs> the, the idea of break, <laughs> The idea of breaking up the Treasury is not a new one, of course. No. And uh, I think Harold Wilson brought in a Department of Economic Affairs, which was nobody quite sure what it was supposed to do. Yeah. And, that not, uh, it didn't last very long. Is that not Yes Minister? No, Yes Minister. He was the Department of Administrative Affairs, oh, which okay. was a satirisation <laughs> of uh, Wilson's idea. But yeah, Jim Hacker was like, oh, yes, I'm Minister for Administrative Affairs. What does that do? I'm not really sure. Is the, the, the joke of it? And uh, and anything you take away from the Treasury, you know, there'll be a huge sort of turf wars power battle within Whitehall, and I think it'll distract from actually dealing with the very urgent problems that have to be dealt with. And they'll all be undone again. It's like schools. They like just let's let's have academies. No, let's have grant maintained schools. Just leave it alone and let them get on with it. Is what I feel. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I say my favourite line from one of the articles, which I think was either Bloomberg or the Washington Post, which referred to the the conservative base, so older voters who have pensions, who own their homes, who are very keen on blocking new developments uh, and, and yet increasing taxes on younger people to, to, to pay for them, referred to them as hobbits. 
in their lovely little hobbit holes, just just not just just shush, shush, shush away from the from the world and uh, leaving the the struggles of I don't know saving Middle Earth from Sauron on the wrong on the One Ring to to other people. I just thought that was a lovely image. That seemed like a very American way also to write about England. Yeah, just bloody <laughs> hobbits. <laughs> you can visualise it though, can't yeah. you? Now let's have a question from one of our Patreon backers in but your emails. And it's kind of growth related. Uh, Peter Gowers asks, why are politicians so afraid of remote work? It really could level up the country. Move the jobs and income to where the housing is, embrace it, leverage universities and improve people's lives. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would take issue a bit with this because... You know, I like working from home. Yeah, absolutely. And it can, it can have great effects like, you know, cutting commuting and cutting congestion and reviving things like cafes in the areas where people live rather than just the ones where they work. But, 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 there's a mm. lot of buts. And they're often buts that don't occur to the people who are proposing this because they are not the ones who uh, cannot work remotely because a lot of work can't be done remotely. And that work is often much lower paid. And so you do risk having a situation where people who are in better paid jobs that can be done remotely have a lot more autonomy and it's all great and they don't have to commute anymore. And people who work in lower paid jobs do, but they don't have the voice. They don't, for example, you know, you can you can start axing buses like we've done in the last two years since the pandemic. You can start running down tra- you know, the, the country's railway system in various ways and you don't get too much protest because people, the middle class, no longer use them and depend on them in the same way. And so they get screwed over. And that is one of the things that goes on. There's also, I think there's also an important thing to be said about, you know, the problems we have in intergenerational issues in Britain at the moment and the feeling, you know, that there are, there are tensions between the generations for reasons we've just been talking about. When do the generations come together? They come together at work. If you're not physically getting people together, you don't have role models, if, if you still see them as role models, for younger people, among older people in the office, you don't you don't have the kind of easy connections that you can cultivate in an office. And I think that's a real, that could be a real problem, could be a real risk. John, you're a role model. Um, <laughs> um, it means I'm old. But obviously, <laughs> as, a, well, I mean, writers are, are often remote working anyway. Yeah. But there, we, we see lots of pieces in the right-wing press sort of fulminating against remote do you, working. Do you know what I think it is? I think they don't trust people not to skive off. I think they just think that they're mucking around or playing solitaire on their computers or whatever their those Telegraph leader writers still have on their old computers. Um, but there was, there was, a, I, I want to say it was a Telegraph. It might not have been an article recently. What do people do when they're working from home? DIY and having sex. Right. Apparently. Well, I, I work from home a lot and I can tell you I don't do either of those. Um, <laughs> and I actually, someone who can work at home all the time if I want, and I choose to go into a library in central London and, and just have a, you know, create a phony commute just for the sake of getting out of the house and meeting some other writer friends. And that sort of balance of two or three days a week in town and a couple of days at home is great for me. And um, if people can recreate that model in the office, I think that's good. But I think there's something very important about socialising with work colleagues. So I think there is, I think people would be happier if they have those one or two, three days at the water cooler, as the Americans say. I mean, I like my sociable fellow. I like uh, getting out of the house. Um, but Rachel, on this specific point, um, it says move the jobs and income to where the housing is. So I suppose he's thinking like hardcore, full force remote work where people are literally all over the country. They can't come into work because they live in Inverness or wherever. Um, so is that, would that work in terms of spreading the, the wealth, allowing people to buy, you know, to buy houses? It's, it's funny you mentioned Inverness because there is a, there's a new statesman writer who was working from the London office before COVID and during COVID decided to move to Edinburgh to uh, live with her boyfriend. And when the management were trying to convince us to come back one or two days a week. She was like, no, I live in Scotland now. And they had to decide what to do about it. And the answer was, okay, you can carry on working from Scotland. Uh, the, the the risk, which um, uh, inevitably people mention, is if you can do the job from Scotland, why not from 
bungalow, Chiang Mai, somewhere where wages and right. housing costs are much, much, much less. So are you in fact uh, creating a situation where suddenly your job doesn't exist anymore because somebody can do it for a lot less money on the other side of the world? I think it really depends on the type of work we're talking about as to how much of a risk that is. Certainly, I think some of the tech companies, Facebook and um, possibly Twitter, were paying people less if they decided that they didn't want to live in cities like San Francisco and, and, and New York where rents are very expensive. Yeah, you want to go off and work remotely from the middle of nowhere, fine, we'll pay you less. Um, but on the politics of it, I think like while agreeing entirely that um, the, the infrastructure point and the recognising that not, not everyone can work remotely is really important. I don't think that's where Jacob rees is coming from when he rails against it. I don't think he has local bus routes in mind, not least because there is a local bus route in his constituency that has recently been cut with devastating effects. My colleague Anoush at the New Statesman went and reported on the missing bus route in uh, Jacob rees mogs constituency in Somerset. Um, I don't think that's what it's about at all. I think it became a culture war front it became a progressive left-leaning workers it became like sort this. of woke didn't it, it working from woke. home somehow. and actually for uh, it, it could be the answer in, in a way to productivity because if you make it a lot easier for parents to mm. work alongside looking after children picking children up from school if you uh, caring for, for elderly relatives if you make it easier for people to fit their work in around their day you will get higher productivity you just have to trust that they will do that now a lot of employers did trust their staff and it seems to be going quite well for them so i'm not quite sure why jacob rees mogg felt the need to get involved well if you can't if you don't come into work you can't lounge around on the furniture can you like mogg yes, you know. can't <laughs> lounge around on the furniture anyway because when he was leaving passive aggressive post-it notes on desk you know sorry i missed you you were out he didn't seem to realize that there weren't enough desks there wasn't enough space for the civil servants in those departments because the government had sold off the office space to cut costs in conclusion the government is bad <laughs> Uh, remember, we're doing a But Your Email special soon, open not just to Patreon people, to everyone. You can email your questions to our old school address, info at romaniacs.com. We'll try to answer as many as we can. Next up, we live in an unhappy age of political pygmies, fallen idols, and don't get your hopes up. But there are still some people to respect. Each panellist is going to choose an admirable politician or activist who hasn't let them down yet. Uh, like an award-winning coming-of-age story set against a backdrop of momentous events, there are bonus points for anyone whose personal good times coincided with a sense that history was on their side. And now, this was a set question at the Q Awards a few years ago, and every pop star I spoke to chose Greta Thunberg. <laughs> So I'm going to institute a Greta ban, Gret Zero, <laughs> to keep things interesting. John, you are our guest, so who's yours? Uh, I'm going to go with my oldest friend, oldest in the sense that he's 90, and that is uh, Lord Alf Dubbs of Battersea, who uh, I've known since I was 22, and he gave me a job as his in the House of Commons, and I worked for him uh, in my first proper job as his researcher. I went off and became a writer. He lost his seat in 87, and I remember saying to him, oh, don't go into the Lords, Alf. What? That's, you know, people are going to think you've b betrayed the left. And he went into the Lords after he lost in 92, and he has been a model of how you can be an effective opposition leader uh, in the second chamber. He is still at the ripe old age of 90, successfully campaigning on unaccompanied minors and refugees. Um, just this year, uh, he was about the only person campaigning on unaccompanied um, Ukrainian children uh, and got a change that means that over, over a thousand children uh, managed to get to Ukraine to hear from Ukraine. That was reported in the Mirror in February. Um, and uh, Alf was the only one campaigning on that. We know about the Dubs Amendment, which uh, caused, uh, uh, which got meant that about 500 Syrian children could get over here. And Alf Dubs 
does this with enormous humility, which is very rare in a politician. He's an absolutely charming bloke. And he himself, of course, was a, an accompanied child refugee uh, back in 1939 coming over from Czechoslovakia. So beat that, everyone, if you can. <laughs> you interviewed him, didn't you, Dorian? Just in the bunker, yeah. recently. And he was just like quite happy to abolish the Lords, even though he, I, is, I know, he is perhaps the best argument for the Lords. He's just like, no, no, you go, I don't mind if you get rid of it. No, he believes in an elected second chamber, but he's being affected within the system as it exists. And um, I was proud to be the master of ceremonies at his 90th birthday party uh, at the House of Lords this year. And he was very ill earlier this year. Um, and he was in intensive care. And I went to see him when he was in hospital. And I thought he came, he's come back out of it and he's campaigning hard. And uh, we should be very grateful that he's still going so strong. That's fantastic. And how um, how nice that you, there's actually a friendship that goes back. Yeah, it goes back a long time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Rachel. I really struggle to think of a politician, which is not to say that I don't think there are politicians doing good things, but this is quite a high bar, um, I think, I think, I think for this question. So I have gone for the disaster planner, Lucy Easthope, who I've just found out was also interviewed on The Bunker. Um, you, you, you look very excited there. I've just been reading a piece about disaster planning, a profile of her, which led me to the history of disaster studies. And I've Isn't been reading about like the, the Halifax explosion of 1917, and I'm completely obsessed with all this stuff. Well, uh, I'm completely obsessed with her. Uh, I've read her book, uh, When the Dust Settles, and I interviewed her uh, earlier this year, and she was the sweetest, loveliest person while talking about how do you make sure that you have enough body bags for natural disasters? Mm. How do you plan for a devastating fire? How do you plan for a pandemic? Um, and it's not just her as my person I admire. It's also the sort of hidden industry of disaster planners and those who go in and pick up the pieces because there have been so many events recently, obviously COVID, uh, Grand the Grenfell fire, uh, natural disasters, looking at the public inquiry into Lucy Letby and the, and the NHS, where you think, okay, we all saw this happening, but there were people, there are people involved who are actually trying to make sense of these horrific things and to support survivors and victims' families and to try and work out what we can do so this doesn't happen again. And we never hear from them. We hear from the politicians who say, something must be done. And there are sort of hidden underclass of people who try and make the world a little bit safer and a tiny bit less devastating while facing human tragedy on a daily basis. And I think that's incredibly inspirational. And I absolutely could not do it. No, it's often quite sort of independently minded crusading types rather than agencies as well. It reminds me of something I reported years ago about, you know, crowd safety at concerts and football matches and so on, and how a lot of the most important figures there were just people that they had been to a gig. They were the survivor of a crush somewhere and they made it their life's work to kind of work out all these really, you know, sensible, practical, but often, you know, really quite sort of grim, yeah, you know, studies and, and, and measures that you take in order to prevent it happening again. And that is actually her story that she tells in the book of being at university and there being some student event and there was a crush and there was mm -hmm. a student who fell off, fell down a flight of stairs and uh, either died or was very, very badly injured. And watching the university not respond to that in a way that was either helpful for, for that individual's family or kind of acknowledging that something had gone wrong and making it better for the future. And she kind of decided that she wanted that accountability. So someone has to push for it. And I think you're seeing that a little bit with the NHS at the moment in, in the, the Lucy Letby case, where what needs to happen is for people to be very upfront about this is what went wrong. This is how we make sure it doesn't happen again. And instead you're getting lawyering up, passing the buck. It definitely wasn't my fault. And you need those crusaders to go. It's it's it's, it's not about blame. It's about saving lives in the future. And obviously, people should read uh, Rachel's uh, interview. Yes. Think, but there's also a very good uh, New Yorker profile of it, which sort of goes into the whole history of this this whole field. And, and, a, a, and a bunker interview with her. And a bunker interview. There's a lot of content. <laughs> uh, Roz? Um, my nomination is a guy called Hashi Mohammed, um, whose um, his day job is a barrister, but he's also an activist. He's not party, really not party aligned. He also came to Britain as a refugee, like uh, Lord Dubbs, um, as an unaccompanied child refugee. Um, and he moved around all over the place, lived in some 
uh, pretty pretty terrible housing, but made it in the end to um, Oxford and uh, you know is now is now a barrister and specialises in planning disputes, which sounds rather boring, but actually it has given him a remarkable insight into what is wrong with um, the way that Britain plans housing and into nimbyism. And he's written a couple of books. And one of them, the most recent one, uh, is called A Home of One's Own. It's really well written. It's really short. I really recommend it. It's short, it's cheap, it's punchy. You can't really ask for more from a, from a book. In, and I interviewed him last year for the series I did, Jam Tomorrow, in the housing episode, because he was able to give a bit of a positive spin on, on nimbyism and what kind of things might persuade people to accept new housing in their neighbourhood, how you could do it uh, with the with the knowledge that he had. And A Home of One's Own, his book, you know, sets out what his journey was was like. And it ends with him moving in to his the house that he was finally able to buy in Wembley. Um, and what a joy that was and the importance that having a home has for people. And he's he's a brilliant communicator. He's a really, really interesting guy. Fantastic. Uh, mine is, uh, he sort of represents almost sort of my feelings about, you know, um, about disappointment. Um, <laughs> is I just find that, that, um, that being on the left, I've seen so many people that at a certain point uh, I really admired just mm. turn into like terrible bastards. Um, real cranks. I mean, when I was a teenager, you know, John, John Pilger's journalism opened my mind. That's mm. absolutely morally appalling, um, I think. And there's loads of people like that where you'd like, was I wrong? Did they change? Mm. Were they always like this? Did the world change? Like, what is it? Um, and somebody who I admire because I think he's been around for so long and, and still I find it's quite sort of courageous and independent-minded is Peter Tatchell, who obviously... Um, activist for gay rights in the 80s, ran for... Bermondsey. Bermondsey, and then kind of infamously yeah. like homophobic yeah, um, campaign yeah. against him. Um, and on Twitter, um, as it will forever be called to me, <laughs> um, he's often, he's, 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 you don't always know what he's going to think about things, but he'll often take a, he's not sort of partisan, he'll often take a stand on things and he'll be very sort of, you know, he's very strong on, you know, think like Ukraine and, and Syria. He's also, and he's willing to take the flack from certain sections of the left. He's sort of very he's supportive of LGBTQ rights, but also kind of supportive of free speech. And so, you know, again, I don't always have to agree with him, but I always get the feeling that he is, he's not collapsed into dogma or conspiracy theories or crank stuff. And so he almost represents somebody that you liked, who you can continue to like as they age, and you're not suddenly going to go, oh, God, what happened there? And a couple of years ago, I saw um, production at the National Theatre of The Normal Heart, Larry Kramer's play about the fight for um, people with HIV to get respect and treatment. And at the end, um, a few rows behind us, Peter Tatchell stood up and gave this very brief sort of like three line speech about what it was like at the time. And it was so powerful and it sort of capped the play for me. And I genuinely felt like, and here's this guy, he's not a, you know, famously, I think he just lives in quite a sort of small flat. He is not a kind of wealthy or powerful or particularly influential person, but it felt like this sort of, this immense figure had stood up and kind of given this production its blessing. And personally courageous as well. So to, mm. to to personally go up to Mugabe and try and arrest him for their a, their policy on uh, gay rights and to get beaten up by, to get beaten up yeah, yeah by his uh, security guards and he knew that I presumed that was going to happen but it was on camera and it was like uh, it drew attention to what Mugabe was doing and you think wow that's putting yourself in the firing line in a way that I probably wouldn't have the courage to do. Mm. I think you're absolutely right though about people who had have views or are known for something and doing very positive work in that area being driven a little bit mad by Twitter and by mm. the need to have an opinion on everything mm. and a very short punchy opinion and no room for nuance and I have seen lo lots of people who I thought were sensible and saying interesting things that I might or might not agree with go further and further down towards extreme views because 
they are pushed that way, often on topics that they weren't necessarily known for in the first place. Right. Like, there's this idea that you have to have an opinion on everything. And one of my New Year's resolutions was to not tweet about stuff that I didn't have strong opinions on, to not feel the need of like, oh my God, this thing has happened. I must tweet out my opinion on it. Um, and I've, I've been a lot happier since not doing that. The, the, the older I've got, the more I've gone, do you know what? I don't know. I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't know enough about it. I had a column on The Guardian for five years and I always had to come down on one side of the fence on the other and what I was writing about. I, was, I found myself going, but on the other hand, I thought this isn't, this is actually not very exciting, you know, uh, writing. But yeah, I think it should be fine to go, I really don't know. And I, you know, I'm sorry, but that's my position and I'd love to know, learn more about it is a very respectable position to hold. That's what makes it so so very difficult to have heroes because, you know, you can only really keep that single-minded admiration of someone if you don't see all the different, you know, less attractive mm. facets of their personality, which unfortunately, as you were saying, Twitter tends to bring out. Uh, it, it pushes you to to be your worst self, I think, in many ways. The figures in history and imagine them on Twitter. Now, I'm really concerned <laughs> You know, George Orwell could have been a real dick on Twitter. Well, I'm yeah, sure it would totally, have been. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's possibly why all of the celebrities picked Greta Thunberg because it's much easier when they're teenagers and they're known for one thing and they're yeah. uncomplicated. I think um, you'd probably get quite a few saying at the time, M Malala Yousafzai. Right, yeah, yeah. Because you're known for one thing and hasn't had time to yeah. grow up into a messy, complicated adult yet. Yeah, but if you get to your 60s without sort of letting everybody down, I think is quite... If Tony Blair had been shot dead on May the 2nd, 1970, he'd be this hero of the left, you know what I mean? I mean, the thing to do is to die young like Che Guevara or John Lennon or whatever, and then you're always held up as this poster boy. Um, but uh, Maybe. As you, I mean, it didn't yeah. work for, say, John Smith. <laughs> no, well, he was not that young, but... No, um, that's true. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> yeah, no, as you get old, I mean, you'd, who, who knows what uh, John Lennon's position would have been on Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it did sort of work for John Smith because a lot of the things that people that don't like Blair, a lot of the things that Blair did mm. were things that John Smith was already doing. Yeah, but everyone's forgotten that. A lot of that. people on the left <laughs> will sort of hold up John Smith as like, if only he mm. had lived and he wouldn't have done all these things. And you actually look at his reforms and obviously Gordon, very close to Gordon Brown and, mm. and so on. And you're like, well, he kind of would have done, but you know, might, he might not have gotten people's tits. In the same way. So it's the moral of this bit of the podcast, die young. Yeah, that's my point. Die young and don't be on Twitter. <laughs> so, okay, so the moral of the first bit was democracy doesn't work. <laughs> that was your, your point. And now die young. Good. Good stuff. Good summer fun. We've reached the end of the show. Thank you to Roz. Thank you. Rachel. Thank you. And our special guest, John O'Farrell. Thank you very much. Patreon supporters can stay tuned for the extra bit after Demon is a Monster by Corner Shop and the traditional thank yous. You two could join them and get the podcast early and without ads plus lots more. Search Oh God What Now Patreon to find out how. We'll see you next time. Thank you.